Okay, so I'm hoping that uh, this morning we'll be finishing up all the um, everything that we wanted to discuss about gasification, including cleanup, and then the um, kinetics-based discussion, which essentially resulted from follow-up questions. Um, and um, and um, and Shantanu is uh, my uh, that uh, pre-submission viva. Sorry, not pre-submission. I mean the viva has been postponed, so I'm not sure. So I think we'll bring forward this afternoon the student presentation as originally scheduled. So I still do not know. Okay. So so for the gas cleanup, let's test our uh, memory a little bit as to. Um, what we have learned so far. Um, so why is cleaning necessary, you think, as you discussed? Such as so turbine is one uh, application. What other applications? Hmm? No, the fuel gas will ne never let them exit to the environment. The flow gas, yes, that's all. Right. But uh, no, the question I'm asking is: apart from gas turbine, what other applications did we talk about of the fuel gas? Okay, so chemicals production, is that right or no? Fuel cell requirements are uh, more stringent or less stringent compared to gas turbines requirement? In terms of which gases? Okay. Okay, so so that then uh, brings us to the question, I mean, what are the major gaseous polluting species? So what do you think? What do you think? What are the major gaseous polluting species? Yeah, those are from flue gas. Those are from combustion systems, but those are not from uh, gasification systems. So for gasification systems, what will be the polluting gaseous species. Can't remember? Okay, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll remember that again. And um, then the solid pollutants. So where are the solid pollutants coming from? Can I ask you? <laughs> idea. Solid pollutants are coming from the ash in the coal, right? That's where they are coming from. These are the particulates. Any other sources? No? Yeah, so it can be taken. I mean, soot usually happens only if you are doing the um, uh, processing at low temperatures. Correct? Correct? Absolutely. Hmm. The catalysts. Okay. So, so only if the catalysts are used in the gasification. And um, so, is there any distinct advantage of using catalysts inside the gasifier? Yes. Yes or no? No or yes? Yes. At low temperatures only. So only if you are doing, say, fluidized bed gasification or even fixed bed, you may consider to have um, uh, catalysts inside the bed, but usually not. Um, because if you use them inside the bed, then you have the bed material, you have the coal itself, and so the catalysts will 
get uh, lost in the matrix of all the coal and ash, etc. So there won't be much left for them to, it will be very difficult to separate them. The only way they, you can separate the catalysts is to, through the cyclones. So you are much better off to use the catalyst not inside the gasifier. Technically you can, but um, in the downstream processing, when everything else has been cleaned. Because what is the, what is the catalyst trying to catalyze? Well, which reactions? There are so many types of reactions. Surface reactions, which means the heterogeneous reactions, gas solid reactions. Absolutely impractical. So, so by uh, so then um, the solid pollutants are essentially the particles, particles coming from the ash, and the ash results from as we heard before from the minerals in the coal. So you need to sequentially identify that. Um, so that's the solid pollutant, and you have very. Um, well articulated the need for cleaning, gas cleaning. And what are the major gas pollutant species? Um, let's, um, we have seen all of these things before. No, we can catalyze any reactions we like. For the, even the chem, um, reactions to make the chemicals, we can catalyze those ones too, and we need to. Otherwise, they will not initiate. They will not large scale. No, no. Because just imagine. I mean, if this is a gasifier, fitting the coal and the catalyst together, they'll just lost. Theoretically, they can work for some time, but with thousand tons of coal and bed materials and ash, etc. The catalyst, 5% catalyst, will get lost in any time. So, so these are um, uh, the gas bases that uh, you had forgotten. You had the sulfur compounds in gasification. Again, the sulfur compounds are not SOX. The um, sulfur oxides is a hydrogen sulfides, carbonyl sulfides carbonyl sulfide um, and carbon disulfide. There may be uh, very uh, different elemental forms of sulfur or other more compounds, uh, complicated compounds such as the marketans or thiophenes, etc. But those come out during the um, those come out during the pyrolysis stage. So it's very important to recognize that. Nitrogen compounds obviously they will be NOx if it is combustion system, if it is not a combustion system, uh, and cyanide, correct, correct, halides, chlorine from chloride from uh, chlorides and bromides, alkalis could be sodium compounds calcium compounds, magnesium compounds, so any alkali element, their compounds can go, uh, can be under the alkali 
content. And then you have the heavy metal. Uh, we talked about chromium a little bit. We uh, talked about selenium a little bit. There are a whole lot of other uh, heavy metals such as the barium and beryllium, you name it. So some of those we did, um, uh, this is for sulfur, these are the sorbents. Some of those we did mention here, um, what are the trace elements. So it's very important that you try to remember what uh, the trace elements that are definitely, definitely can originate from the, um, from the coal processing, whether it is um, combustion systems or gasification system. Okay. So, so that was a little bit of test of how much was retained. So now, so up until last week, we did speak about the um, conventional filters uh, to separate out the particles, that there could be ceramic candle filters or metallic filters. And the types of filtration systems to, um, types of filtration systems to um, separate, to separate, yeah filter out the gaseous pollutants and in case of the gaseous pollutants we did see that it's not just physical adsorption it's actually chemical reaction through which you are extracting this species out so for example hydrogen sulfide with a metal oxide um, it gives you the metal sulfide and water vapor so the the sulfide gaseous sulfide that goes out and water vapor is not a pollutant and metal oxide can be separated and then the metal oxide can also be regenerated we did talk about that right how it can be regenerated we mentioned it a little bit how So we said that is uh, through the, by the looping mechanism, you should be able to do it, right? So, so sorry, which resins? Uh, not at um, the sort temp the temperatures that we have been talking about. Uh, these are all ambient uh, temperature application mainly for water uh, filtration in water s treatment systems which is just normal temperature and nothing else okay. so technically filtration in itself is a uh, is a wide ranging subject uh, and there are a lot of subsections where in which people do carry out their own phd work so water filtration for example is one uh, filtration of um, the um, the bugs, the the bacteria is another one. It's a complete, even though it's a, under the broad topic of filtration, but the operating regime, etc., are completely different. And here we are talking about high temperature uh, filtration, right? Upwards of 250 degrees Celsius. Not, not less. Okay, so having said that, let's see what some of the major commercially operating gasification units, um, what type of filters do they use? Because um, it's good for us to talk about this from laboratory scale or bench scale experiments uh, experience. It's another thing to know what does work at the large scale or doesn't work. Because at the large scale, people will be, unless they work um, for um, continuously, for over a very, very long period of time, and in a consistent manner, no one will adopt a thing. And so we, so let's see this. So Wabash is in US. 
Um, it uses the e-gas gasifier. What is the e-gas gasifier? We showed one of the schematics. It's a two-stage slurry fed gasifier. Um, okay. That uses the metallic candle filters. But look at the temperature range. Um, okay, let me digress a little bit. All the presentations are now available in Dropbox presentations and the journal papers that I am alluding to. Uh, this I have loaded some yesterday and some early this morning. So it should be able to be looked at by you whenever you want to. Including uh, this one, the, uh, the second part of the gas cleanup lecture. So what um, important thing is um, in the e-gas gasifier, this is a slurry fed system. And um, the top part and the bottom part, in both of those parts, you uh, feed in coal, slurry. The bottom part does predominantly the combustion and the gases from the combustion from the bottom part goes and tries to uh, carry out the reactions because the products from the bottom part of the gasifier are carbon dioxide and water vapor. Right? Because if you burn carbon, then you will predominate uh, coal which has carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, sulfur, etc., then you'll be predominantly getting carbon and water, carbon dioxide and water vapor. Obviously, you'll get NOx and SOx as well. But as far as the reactants are concerned, it's predominantly it's only carbon dioxide and water vapor. The others are not reacting agents. So the so the important thing to note in here. Um, is that the gas from the gasifier, the gasifier operates at well over 1200 degrees Celsius. Why does it operate at well over 1200 degrees Celsius? Correct. And carbon conversion. So in order to have uh, sufficient uh, carbon, acceptable carbon conversion, you need to provide it a certain temperature. The temperature that, um, that um, uh, we have shown for different coals, it is different. Sometimes you need 1200, sometimes you need 1300. Some coals you may need only 1100. So that's why we need a um, uh, high temperature, but even higher temperature is needed that's carbon conversion is one side of the story. Higher temperature is needed for um, melting the ash so that ash can be taken up. So it is the second stage where the recycled ash, I mean the from the uh, from the um, gasifier uh, from the cyclone it comes. So if you can recall the gasifier look something like this. This is stage one. This is stage two. And from here, you have the cyclone. that goes into this first stage. Okay. And um, from the top of the cyclone then goes your other materials, other gases out. The um, particle free or majority of the particles being taken out. Um, from the, uh, by the cyclone and the whatever particles are separated here and you have there the candle filters um, 
the candle filters are like that as we showed in one of the slides if you can recall um, so the there is a reason for this ash separated particles going here why do you think it goes here and not there So both of you are correct. And you have complemented the answers. The carbon from the coal, when it goes to the high temperature here, um, it eventually becomes char to some extent. But that becomes very unreactive or less reactive. Let me put it that way. Why it becomes less reactive? Because it is becoming more and more structured. And also, um, it is now full of ash rather than full of carbon. So there is no incentive to bring it back in this stage where it is a lean phase of the gasifier. Here it is a solid combustor. This is stage two is char gasifier rather than anything else and if you can recall your um, you put in coal here coal plus coal slurry here as well as here and also here but predominantly here less here so here all the as much little as little coal as is possible you will send together with what you think we cannot be realistically converted in the um, uh, anymore through gasification that's why it, 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 they will be coming in here and we talked about a little bit about the residence time here can anyone remember what is that Five, six minutes. How much time did we talk about here in the gasification stage? Huh? One minute. Any other ideas? Of course, it depends on the temperature. <laughs> so, give me some time, uh, uh, indication of time. So, someone said uh, 60 seconds. So, that's a good starting point. 24 seconds, okay. So, because that came from that experimental paper. So, 60 seconds is one, 24 seconds is another one. What else? I'm very mean this morning, aren't I? <laughs> Asking all the hard questions on a Monday morning when we still have, have hang up from the World Cup cricket final. That's totally unfair. <laughs> That's why. Okay, so let's, um, um, and that's why I said what I said. So I want to check uh, how many of you have remembered. So, so what's the particle size of the coal in the slurry? This is entrained for gasifier. Yeah, less than one, less than thousand micron, yeah, for sure. Hundred, hundred micron. Anyone else? Yes. So you have given the two extremes. So 10 to 100 micron. 
essentially that's the range. Okay. And what I said is that this cannot be very large. The 24 seconds that you mentioned that came from our laboratory trials and the slides will tell you there that if you are doing it at 1000 degrees, then in order to get close to 100% carbon conversion, you will need 24 seconds. But um, given that the velocity is there, which I said, it was not written in this slide, the velocity is there at about 10 meters per second. So 24 seconds, if you want to do it, then it will equal 240 meters, which is not practical. So it's about six, that much really, not more than that. That's why if you go to any gasification plant, the tallest structure that you will see is actually most likely of that of the gasification uh, superstructure. So that's what I have been telling, and, and it is, these are some of the important I, uh, parameters that I really would love you to remember. It's extremely important. The other sub nitty gritty, you can find it from the lecture slides and from anywhere. The other one <coughs> that the cold water slurry, so you have water there, you have coal there, and so what did I what did I say? This is consisting of what percentage of coal and what percentage of uh, water? Forty, fifty percent water. Absolutely right. So this is about forty to fifty percent. And this is the rest. Right? So this term is called solids loading. Solids loading is a very important determinant. Of course, the more solids that you can put in the slurry, the better it is. Otherwise, there will be a problem. So I also would li like you to remember this term. So I've got another person who I can ask questions. So that's right, and that's why I was precisely coming in. Why do we use slurry? Ideally, we would like to use without any water because water goes into the gasifier, soaks up so much latent heat, then sensible heat, then superheat, which is not ideal. Hmm? Right. So, so another thing that I would like, like you to remember, absolute, I am borrowing your language, switching, easier loading. Because the rheology of cold water slurry can be predictable, can be measured, can be modeled, and is predictable, simple as that. So this is the other one that I would like you to remember that cold water slurry is, um, is for purely for engineering purpose. No, slurry, slurry the beautiful thing is the, the water creates a perfect barrier from, for anything else to go from the inlet side or from the gasifier side, as you would expect. So what are the problems encountered in dry feeding? Who can tell me? We discussed that one too.
For dry feed, we talked about lock hoppers. Remember? The only way. It's purely mechanical device, one on top of the other. Right? So the dry injection system always depends on the lock hoppers. And at the bottom of the lock hopper, you have a short, um, very sh short length um, screw, which takes the pressurized dry material into the gasifier. And we also talked about particle size, agglomerating, or ash, uh, sorry, the coal bridging. In, in the in the in the in the lock hoppers, so the lock hoppers are like this, right? They have um, they have the they have the um, uh, cylindrical part and they have the bridge. Uh, sorry, the conical part, and you have two of those, one on each top of them, and then underneath them, then you have the um, screw feeder falling directly here and in this side then you have the gasifier this is kept very short very very short and not only very short we also say that <coughs> it has to be kept very uh, dry the materials have to be kept very dry that's why we inject um, hot nitrogen here which comes from air yeah, separation plant. Hmm? So how many of you here are mechanical engineers? Oh, everyone like me. OK, so that's it. Uh, OK, let's have some fun. How, uh, how can a solid, <laughs> solid flow? through an incline. Dr. Davi, you are not uh, mechanical, right? You are also mechanical. Modu, you are also mechanical. A uh, bunch of mechanicals uh, trying to become chemical. Okay. This chemical is easy. Yeah, this chemical is easy. So anyway, it's, um, so if you have a solid, Flowing vertically, what, are, what is the main parameter that you should be looking at from mechanical engineering point of view? What is it called? Vertically or? Hmm? Yeah, gravita gravitational forces, definitely. That's also true. What else? What else? There's something called angle of repose. No. <laughs> so there are two angle of repose, right? What are those? One is the static angle of repose, the other one is the dynamic angle of repose. Which one is smaller in general? Huh? Yeah. Correct. So the, um, what, uh, to answer your question, the lock hoppers angles are decided purely looking at the dynamic angle of repose of the particles. And the dynamic angle of repose of the particles is determined by the particle size 
moisture content in the particles. The drier these are, larger the particles are, easier they will flow. If they are dry, very dry, but very fine, then you have problems. You have problems of um, these things coming and then forming a bridge here. They will not flow. And in that case, then you will have to have certain other assistance provided to the particles to break the bridge so that it flows. So this is also provided there. Not easy it's in the Toya system. Um, so, um, so that's very important. But everything we started, all the discussions we started uh, from why the separation uh, the, from the candle filters um, is uh, separated solid particles are fed here and not, not there, simply because they are, first of all, they are fine and um, small, much smaller particle. And uh, then uh, they are unreactive as someone has said, and therefore it will be much better to utilize it through combustion, as you have said. So that's why it goes into the first stage. Or, in general terms, to the combustion stage of the gasifier, and each gasifier, um, directly or indirectly, is a two-stage. You have a combustor somewhere at the bottom part of the gasifier, uh, or you have, uh, and the top part is always the, um, uh, the reductor. So uh, in one of the slides, as uh, you can, if you can recall, we did also mention about the gas, uh, Mitsubishi's gasifier, or we did, uh, or Siemens one, is the throat part, so the coal actually goes here and uh, here. Uh, the the I mean the coal will be going here, so that this part will be combustor, and of course oxygen mainly, and little bit less coal will be will be go going here. So the top part, which is reductor, bottom part, which is a combustor. The point I'm making is that each gasifier is essentially a um, two-stage gasifier. Whether it's a dry feed, um, dry feed Siemens or Shell, etc., or the Chinese ones, or the uh, wet feed um, uh, ConocoPhillips or G, etc., or TPRI, etc. Our top part is reductor. Yeah. And this part, stage two, is combustor. So this is where all the gasification reactions take place. This is where predominantly carbon dioxide, which is exothermic, that takes place. And all the gasification reactions that we showed uh, before, C plus half O2, C plus water vapor, C plus CO2, and few other methanation reactions, etc. These are all endothermic. They take pl uh, place in the top part. Okay. So all gasifiers are uh, two-stage gasifiers. The top part is where the reduction reactions take place. That's why it's sometimes it's called uh, um, reductor, or the endothermic reactions take place. The bottom part is where it combustion takes place. And the combination of these two, reductor and the combustor, is called the gasifier. 
So whether it is a Shell or Siemens or Hitachi or TPRI or GE or ConocoPhillips or many others, same, two stage. Okay, so, but these are the ones I would love you to remember, please, uh, when you talk to someone about gasification. Then, um, but this is what I would, I am referring your attention to, even though it is metallic uh, candle filters, and we said there will be um, iron aluminite, FeAl N3, or iron aluminum nitride. We have listed some of them in the previous slides in this um, uh, uh, cleanup uh, presentation. This, when we said that they can go to high temperature, despite that, the the plant manufacturer, the plant operators are very, very conservative. They don't go to high temperatures. They know that there's all sorts of bad things can happen, and therefore they run it at conservatively low temperature, making sure that everything can go very well. Then the Bougainam in Neuen Power in Holland, uh, which I believe has just been recently been um, shut down because of the Holland government, the government's directive. I don't know the exact story behind it. Which started as a coal-fired uh, unit back in 92, 262 megawatt. Um, and then uh, it was then using coal plus coal-fired with all sorts of biomass and also wastes. There also they, they use um, ceramic candle filters, either the metallic filters or the candle filters of the uh, uh, metal or uh, the material of choice. Okay, um, but look at the temperature. Very very low. Berat in Germany, the high temperature Untler gasifier, which is similar to the. Um, gasifier that I operated, pressurized fluidized bed, HTW stands for high temperature Winkler, because Winkler is the person, German engineer who invented it, designed it in the first place in the early 1900s. So in Germany there are a number of those using lignites and they were using ceramic candle filters again low temperatures. The Mississippi and Mesaba power in US, um, they were going to, I mean they built the plant, they commissioned it, um, they ran it for a little while. So all candle filters, some candle filters, um, uh, the ceramic candle filters and some metallic filters, they tried all sorts of things um, uh, before deciding on metallic filter of their case. But the one good thing is, even though everyone becomes very conservatively low as far as the operating temperature is concerned, uh, these filters can um, reduce the particulate loading to below one parts per million weight. So that's a very, very low number, significantly low number. The other ones can then, subsequent to the these filters, the gas can be considered to be clean enough to go for other systems which will be used for cleaning other things, such as sulfur cleaning, such as nitrogen-based gas cleaning or chloride cleaning, that's where it will come to close to zero. That's it. So in a gasification plant, let's try to revive our memory again. After the gasifier, the gas is full of particles and polluting species, gaseous species. They go through the cyclone, 
then they go through the metallic filters, then they go through the other cleanup systems for mercury or chlorides or sulfides or something else. So it's quite sequential and quite um, uh, involved. All because the downstream gas, as all of you have identified, for either gas turbine or fuel cell or chemicals production, those downstream processes have very stringent particulate tolerance levels. So you need to clean them up like anything. Okay. So your starting point is, I am doing the filtration at low temperature anyway, 260. And you are saying that at 260, alkalis will be condensed. Nitrogen gases maybe, may not be, not sure, maybe. Sulfur gases, hydrogen sulfides may be condensed. So why do we need it? So what will be your, say you all are engineers working for a client brainstorming and at the end of the brainstorming session you are supposed to come to a consensus uh, to a question raised by one of the colleagues. So let's start taking some views from this side. So what will be your view? Will you, will you recommend another cleanup system? If so, why? If not, why? Anyone can uh, jump in. Oh. Speak up again. After that, mechanical, I mean the uh, chemical planning. So, so I think you have taken us to taken us to the right direction. That the metallic filters may not condense everything out, may not condense the ammonia, may not condense the hydrogen cyanide, may not condense the chloride, may not condense the sulfides. Some may be, but not all. That's why you need to have another one or another ones on the other side. Of course, if you find during operation or during modeling, that uh, it is possible, it, it is taking out everything, then you won't need it. But if you find during experiments or during tests 
and during um, uh, the, during laboratory tests, during bench scale tests, during uh, uh, through modeling, that no, I am not removing everything. Then you will have to have another one because the concentration of the pollutant, gaseous pollutant species, is a function of the equilibrium. There are when there are so many gases present, carbon monoxide, hydrogen, ammonia, hydrogen chloride, um, HCN, H2S, etc. If you perform normal equilibrium composition as a range of temperatures, then you might see that um, that uh, that if this is your temperature, the concentration of those species, percentage concentration of those species, they will, um, they will follow a certain curve. At a low temperature, they may, their presence may be very low. At a higher temperature, their concentration may be very high. So this temperature that you are having here, and this may be for ammonia, there may be something else for H2S, I don't know, you can do the calculations and you can find it out. So the point I'm making is, if you do the calculation for equilibrium calculation for all this sort of gases, or some of those, as a function of temperature, the equilibrium con constants are all available. Then you will see uh, this, type of this type of curves. So your 260 degrees may be somewhere here. At 260 degrees, maybe one of the species has completely condensed out, but the other ones are still going out. That's one thing. That's equilibrium calculation. So equilibrium calculations give you only the upper limit. But these are also kinetic, kinetically driven um, reactions. The capture of the gaseous um, uh, species, condensation of the gaseous species uh, on, the, on a particle uh, which is in the candle filter. That will not happen instantaneously. It will take some time, so it's a kinetic process. Maybe you are not giving sufficient time for that gas in here, for that to happen. Right? So am I clear? So all you need is to, and this is the task of the uh, design engineer, to find out from the, calcula from the calculations what will be if my, at the starting, if this is the concentration of the gases, and if I am running it at 200 x degrees, then over a very long period of time, which means equilibrium, what will be the concentration? That's this. But if I run it, if they, the, the uh, condensing gases do not get that long time, then uh, they will not condense fully. They might condense only partly. So you need to find it out. Sometimes you need to do it through calculations. Sometimes you need to complement the calculations with laboratory scale experiments. That's why these companies involve the universities or their in-house R&D department to actually find out what's happening. And then they decide, OK, now it would be much better off to have another guard bed, another conversion uh, to take out the rest, uh, or otherwise.
So, so that's another story of compensation and the closeness. Not even touched. Um, where what will happen once they have been condensed into a liquid form? That's that's a different uh, equation, and that's also the consulting engineers or the design engineers will take that into account. But our focus is now to take all of those species from the gases. This gas from here leading to the cyclone, after the cyclone to the filter, and after the filter to to the Warm, warm gas cleanup, warm gas cleanup. So, so it is um, this temperature. Warm gas cleanup, hot gas cleanup is higher, 600, 700, 800, 900, and they, the companies have found it so difficult that they eventually abandoned it said at those temperatures we cannot give you assurance that they will be they can be cleaned up because the equilibrium calculation will tell you that as temperature increases their presence in the gas overall gas will be high am i right or wrong right sure Sometimes I tell otherwise to check if you are sleeping or listening. So am I right or wrong? Right, so, okay, that's fun. That's why you have been concentrating. So, uh, <laughs> so you cannot. It will be very, very difficult to do the hot gas cleanup and to come to a stage where the gas is so clean that it will be embraced by the gas turbine manufacturer or fuel cell manufacturers or others. That's precisely the reason that I looked over the weekend and then found out where, wh what temperatures do these big players, these are what temperatures these big players they use in their large, <coughs> large plant. There must be a reason for it. They all, you see, less than 400 degrees centigrade, some even less than 300 degrees centigrade. And it hasn't happened uh, without a reason. There must be a reason for it. And the reason is thermodynamics as well as you're not getting what you want to get. But when, okay, some very good questions coming up this morning. So say this, this temperature in here is 1300, okay, for carbon conversion and slagging, blah, blah, blah. Here, cyclone is not a problem. Cyclone, you can do any temperature you like. So maybe because between this position and that position it has dropped to 1200, so you lose 100 degrees, but you don't completely lose it because you take some of the heat out through indirect cooling. Then from here to here you do it at 260, huge drop. What do you do? Of course, there is a loss of exergy. We cannot avoid. But the bottom line is, I want a plant which will operate with clean, which will give me clean product gas. So, you don't. How, when I when the temperature drops from here to there to there, it's it has to drop for certain 
uh, being aided by something. So that's the cooling. And in most cases, they generate the steam. So it's not entirely lost. Part of it obviously will be lost, uh, lost, but then that steam can be brought back and used for some other purposes within the system. Yeah, yeah. That's why we showed, um, if you can recall, um, that um, that for uh, if the alkalis and chlorides haven't dropped to a to an acceptable level, then you should be looking at um, uh, certain types of um, filters or certain types of filter materials, and then. Um, uh, oh. And then if you want to take, if you want to ensure that the trace elements have been taken care of, then that can be taken care of by the, by the ceramic filters. So ceramic filters means 260 degrees. The ceramic filter is taking out the trace elements. Ceramic filters are not taking out the chloride really, but they are taking out the, so you have different systems for different uh, removal of different types of pollutants. So let's try again. Um, cyclones for the large particles. Large particles means still small, um, but the small, uh, the larger ones in in uh, uh, larger ones in the particles that are present. Then the metallic filters, they take out the finer ones, and then. In the metallic filters are also condensing out some of the, hopefully, some of the other species. And then whatever remains, and you have measurement systems, detection systems for those, those will be taken care of by other more specialized filter, filtration system. Mm. No flashing, no flashing, so no pressure drop, uh, no deliberate pressure dropping. In fact, they, you don't like to have deliberate pressure dropping across the candle filters because they will create flow induced vibration. Again, another thing understood by the mechanical engineers, not by chemical engineers. Because the candles will break, just they will snap on the bottom. Okay. Fine. So can I move? Okay. So I have put a, a in the Dropbox a paper um, by Wang et al. I think there are about six authors that. This one thing is experimentally to find out, but this by any means for an engineer like me, it uh, makes very good sense. They did a modeling study, uh, validated their model uh, for particulate control. Um, so they had a physical um, uh, model that they had, uh, and a physical system wherein they had um, some packed spheres of certain materials of about five millimeter diameter and that gave average bed porosity about 0 0.4, 0 0.5 uh, around that. Um, so they just randomly packed those and then through them they sent their gas. Essentially they were trying to see as a function of time, how much particles are separated out uh, by this packed bed and in a way you can imagine that the candle filters, the filters themselves are also a collection of very uh, 
tightly packed small particles, right? The filters are like that. Um, so, so they did this uh, type of simulation work, um, CFD based work. But in order to validate their model and what the predictions were, uh, we will see later on. They, um, uh, they generated the experimental data and then they tried to validate their model. So their physical system looked something like that. And their mathematical model, um, of course, those of you who are CFD specialists, you know, it's, uh, you have a continuum phase which takes care of all the gases takes care of the gas phase, if I may say so. And uh, you can test all sorts of turbulence models. And I believe they used SST K omega model. Um, and uh, bringing in the concepts of effective viscosities, etc. I'm not a modeler myself, so I'm not delving into something that I'm not capable of uh, discussing. but. From an engineering point of view, what is m most important, whether that makes sense to me, that's what I, I am putting in here. So is the continuum phase or the gas phase um, they um, uh, consider by bringing in the appropriate turbulence model. And then the discrete phase, which takes care of the ash particles, which are laden in the gas. So that's taken care of by not by the, the by the Eulerium, but the but the Lagrangian model uh, for dispersion, and with the help of appropriate DAC coefficients and the particle Reynolds number, etc., which represents the regime that exists here. Um, so they replicate that. And of course, they carry out the experiments in that regime in their physical system that I showed in the previous slide. Um, so, and and some of their predictions I'll just I have just copied and pasted in the subsequent slides. But the point I'm trying to make is, these days, as CFD has become faster and more sophisticated. You are actually capable of uh, doing this modeling. Of course, the proof of the model, whether it's a good one or not so good one, uh, will be uh, based on the validation, which has to come from your experimental work for a representative system. And that's what they have done. They also have done uh, or reported uh, what is called the filtration models, uh, filtration model, sorry, um, um, with one assumption. Uh, so, so let me go one step back. What filtration means is means the filtering out the particles, fly ash particles, from the gas in the bed, as if the bed is mimicking the metal filters or the candle filters. And um, and then they, that way they are separating. That's where they are filtering out the particles. The biggest assumption that they make is that the fl the fly ash together with the gas comes at comes into the candle filter at high temperature, but because the filter is maintained at a low temperature, 260 or whatever temperature. You can vary that in your model. You can vary that during your experiment. Then um, uh, the assumption is that the, uh, the, uh, the, all the fly ash particles, which may be in semi-molten state. Remember, we talked about the liquidus temperatures, etc. That they will immediately encounter the uh, low temperatures in the part in the bed in the bed of the filter and that they will condense. So without that assumption, they cannot go forward. So these are the, uh, these are the assumptions that they make. So the point I'm trying to make is you develop your uh, physical model, 
the actual model where you carry out the experiments. Then you develop your engineering, uh, sorry, the mathematical model where you do the simulation. And um, the, in, in that one, the, uh, as you take into account the continuum phase and the uh, discrete phase, uh, then you also put in the model for filtration of the particles. So that those can all be built in and those can then give you certain predictions um, that you want to implement or test in your real system. So in your real system, what you do you actually want to um, see? You want to see if I have particles coming in, uh, coming in at a certain loading, that means so many um, grams of particles per meter cube of the gas flow, how much it is reduced to. That's what the filtration system will do. That's what the metallic filters will do. That's what the candle filter will do. We know, we have seen from the previous slide that all the metallic, metallic candle filters are capable of reducing the particulate concentration to below one parts per million. The point I'm making is, for that, you don't necessarily now have to do the experiments at that temperature at this full scale. You can now model them and then get some information out and that's what these models do. So how they do it and exactly what is the mathematical procedure, that's there in that paper which I have kept, uh, the paper which is there at the bottom. Paper number two, it's, it says, it is there in the Dropbox. And that will give you, if you have interest, and if you have that expertise, that will give you uh, all the details from in that are, are available in that paper and the, in its own references. So I do not do it. I do not know exactly how to do it, but I know what they are doing and whether their results are credible or not. So that's why I have copied that one and put that into the... Now this discrete phase is completely for the... No, there is, they are, they are not assuming any liquid phase at all. The discrete phase... So immediately on hitting, on hitting the bed particles, they were condensing to solids. So that's the starting point. So it's, it may, the, that's the point that I made, that the particles may be semi-molten as they are escaping the gasifier. But in their, uh, in their model, they are not considering anything other than a solids model and a gas phase model. Because if you try to bring in liquid, it's completely unnecessary because the temperature is so low, 260 or 370, the particles will condense immediately. In fact, the particles will condense as they get out of the gasifier anyway through the um, cyclone and then to the metallic filter even more. So their starting point, no more liquid. Uh, so it's not three phase at all, two. That's good enough. So anyway, before we break, let's go to it a little bit. And these are some of, this is actually a very good paper. I mean, it makes engineering sense to me. And uh, that's how they uh, looked at their um, control volume. And um, the, as if the, this is the uh, inlet side and that's the, um, um, the other side of the, of the packed bed. And these packed beds in a metallic filter can be only a few millimeter thick because the particles in the metallic filter has been formed from sintered metal particles, by sintering metal particles. Um, and, um, and then they can then actually predict, the model can actually predict as a function of um, uh, as a function of time, uh, the upper one is at x 
uh, the, I think half an hour, the lower one is one hour. How, how the filtered material, which is denoted by these spheres here, how on the filter material the gases, are, the particles are depositing. And the particles are condensing and depositing. Okay. So, so these sort of predictions are very well available now. From an engineering point of view, I am more interested in seeing when half of the metal particle in the filter, the candle filter, is more or less uh, deposited by the incoming ash particles as they condense and coalesce because that will tell me when to start purging nitrogen to dislodge those deposited ones, put them in here so that they can be brought back to the stage one. That's the most important thing. So, so the, the point I'm trying to make is you don't have to go on up the days when people needed to do all of these things by trial and error, by only experiments and nothing else. And now with the help of CFD and faster and faster computers, you can actually literally simulate them second by second, how these particles or the filter metals, the candles get uh, deposited on. So the... Uh, mm -hmm. So, so you find it out and then let me know tomorrow. Because I'm not uh, quite, it's, we have some sort of critical number then. So you find it out and then let me know. So that's your homework. For this afternoon or maybe tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning. Okay. Always delay a little bit. Okay, that's fine. Um, so find it out. Well, the only hint I can give you is some kind of critical So, so what happens is, in a real filter though, forget about the model for the time being, in a real filter, if this is your real filter, you have the fast bank of, this way the gases are coming, you have the fast bank of candles, you have the second row of candles, so the second bank, third bank, etc. The fast ones will see least amount of particles, right? Then why did you say yes? <laughs> First ones will see the most. So the, so the beauty of these models is that you can actually literally predict them. And then through experiments, uh, you can fine tune the models. How much particles as a function of time the first banks will see, the second banks will see, third bank, fourth bank, etc. will see. And accordingly you can decide, okay, the purging is expensive with nitrogen. I will purge only my first bank very frequently, second bank less frequently, third bank even less frequently, fourth bank even less frequently. So the models can actually tell you, and models will tell you that sort of information. That between the first and the second, second and the third, third and the fourth, this is the sort of differences that you should be factoring in, in your operational regime. So it's a beautiful tool. So for example, in here, uh, just to give you an example and nothing else, if the gases are coming in here and you have the several banks, one after the other, one after the other, then literally you can see through the models as a function of time, how each bank, each row is getting deposited on. Okay. Yeah. 
And there's just one more slide. Something. And um, then the other beautiful thing, as the most important thing from my point of view, is that you can actually predict the velocity field inside the particles, I mean the inside each of the filter elements, if I may say so, and outside it. And that is extremely important because that will tell you whether the flow-induced vibrations are going to give you any problems or not, or it will, will that be manageable. Okay. So um, this is a very good paper, and this is something that I, uh, this paper I found very credible, related to the work, and one of the few work who have done their own experiments and then validated it rather than taking your experimental data and he carrying out the um, uh, modeling. Because you then know how good is your experimental data. So let's come back and stay on this theme. We have few, quite a few things to do. <laughs>